Hey, so I'd like to present Very GPU. Uh, so what is Very GPU? Very GPU is work to create an open source GPU ASIC. So we're explicitly targeting ASIC, not FPGA. We want it to be fast. It's only for machine learning, and we want to primarily use open source tooling. Uh, so what are some of the motivations or end games for this? Like, taping out an ASIC is very expensive, like millions of dollars. I'm not going to pay for that. So how to handle that? So what I'm imagining in my head is that if, if someone wants to today create a, a startup that distributes, creates, manufactures a GPU, they have to design that GPU and verify that GPU. And that's a significant barrier to entry. It's a significant hurdle that they have to overcome. Now, if we can create an open source GPU that's fully verified, that people know, OK, if I can get the money to take this out, it's going to work, that's, that significantly reduces the barrier to entry to creating a startup that creates a GPU. So then there's like two possible ways forward, I see. So one is like someone creates a startup, gets VC, tapes it out, and distributes it. And then another is like a large company like, say, Facebook uh, could tape it out and distribute it. Why might Facebook do that? Well, that, that creates an alternative to like Google's TPU, for example. Maybe. Some design decisions. We're explicitly targeting FPGA. So in the past, I had some OpenCL projects where I would develop the projects on NVIDIA GPUs. And they worked pretty well on NVIDIA GPUs, but when I tried them on, on AMD GPUs, because I'd spent all my time optimizing for NVIDIA, they ran pretty slowly on the AMD. So what I want to avoid is if I target FPGAs or I test on FPGAs, I will naturally over time optimize for FPGAs. There are things you can do on FPGAs that you can't do on ASICs and vice versa. If I'm targeting FPGAs, I won't be using the full capabilities of the ASIC and I will naturally be optimizing for F FPGA. So I'm just not going to do FPGAs at all, like only ASIC and, and simulation. Uh, for us, machine learning. Right now, because we're targeting machine learning, that means there's some optimizations that we can do. So recently, there is a type of float called BrainFloat 16, BF16. This is becoming quite popular in large models like transformers, very large language models. It has the same dynamic range as FP32, but it uses fewer bits. And so the calculations, everything, space, memory transfer, everything goes faster. So I want to only, only target BF16. No FP16, no FP32, no FP64. So for example, NVIDIA GPUs, they're going, they have to do like all of these. They have to do BF16, FP16, FP32, FP64. And that uses a lot of extra dice space and it reduces the yield. All right, so by only doing BF16, we, we save dice space, we increase the yield. Similarly, for the FP operators, there are some operators that are needed by machine learning, specifically logarithms, exponential, possibly Tanha. Uh, but there's a, a lot of other operators that we don't need for machine learning, for running transformers and so on. So we can just not implement those. That saves more dice space and increases the yield. Right, and then I wanted to work with PyTorch. So there are a number of deep learning frameworks out there. So TensorFlow is one, PyTorch is another, and there are others. I'm choosing PyTorch. I've used PyTorch a lot, I'm very familiar with it. It's used extensively in both industry and in research. So yeah, this is my choice. That doesn't mean that we couldn't also get very GP working on TensorFlow. I'm just only targeting PyTorch. Um, and we wanted to use primarily open source tooling. All right, so here is like the end-to-end -end planned architecture. This screen is split into two halves. So on the left-hand side over here, we've got like the main board, the PC, the, the main host computer. And on the right-hand side, we've got the GPU card. And the GPU card comprises like, we've got DDR global memory on the card, and then we've got the GPU die itself, which is the ASIC that we're taping out. Uh, so on the left, we've got PyTorch. That communicates using a PIP, PIP API with our host side runtime. And then that host side runtime is gonna handle things like virtual memory, transferring data to and from the GPU from the main memory, um, and like launching kernels. That's gonna communicate through PCIe to the GPU controller that sits on the die. The GPU controller is gonna similarly handle like virtual memory, uh, starting and stopping uh, kernels and so on. Uh, we've also got a compute unit which contains multiple GPU cores. Uh, we've got DDR controller and then we've got DDR global memory that sits on the card, not on the die. Um, and then some shared memory. There's also some risk-free kernels, all right? So PyTorch, when you can compile, when you compile PyTorch, 
it's going to compile the GPU kernels at the time of compilation. So these could be CUDA kernels compiled into like the CUDA ISA. It could be um, AMD HIP kernels compiled into the HIP ISA. We are using RISC-V, so we need the GPU kernels to be compiled into a RISC-V. Right, so of this architecture, what exists now and uh, what is to do? In blue, we've got the things that exist now, and in yellow are the things that we need to do. So we've got the host side runtime, so that exists. We can already run C++ C++ programs with GPU kernels in. Those GPU kernels will be transferred to what I'm running in simulation, right? to the simulated GPU and will then run in the simulated GPU core. Uh, we've got a GPU controller which handles the other side of the communication, sits on the die. Uh, we've got a GPU core which handles like basic arithmetic, int and FB. Currently FB32, we need to migrate that to FB16. We don't have the PCI interface or the DDR controller and currently we haven't compiled these RISC-V kernels for PyTorch. Uh, okay, right, so then some design decisions. So there are other design decisions, but these are the design decisions that I found, felt the answers were less, least clear to me. So I had to think about these more than many other design decisions. Uh, so we've got how to work with PyTorch. Uh, well, actually, ISO choice and design is relatively straightforward with some nuance. Uh, how to handle the DDR memory and PCI link, and do we need network on a chip? All right, so how to make it work with PyTorch? Right, so there's a few options here. So one is to integrate directly with PyTorch. So we couple it directly into PyTorch. We modify PyTorch to call directly into our very GPU code. The issue with this is lots of development would, would be needed, and PyTorch will push back because we're not using a standard interface. A, a fairly tempting on the surface option is to use OpenCL. Why, why does it appear tempting? Well, because it's an open standard. However, we would still need lots of development because PyTorch doesn't yet work with OpenCL. Now, there is a lone developer working on migrating PyTorch to work with OpenCL. That work is in development. Now, even if they succeeded, a challenge, a fundamental limitation with OpenCL is that OpenCL needs to work across many platforms and many vendors. That means whenever any functionality is implemented, it involves discussion with like 15, 17 vendors around a table, and they all have little things that they want to do and change. So the result is the standard has to handle all of these different vendors and requirements, which makes it quite complicated, and it's hard to implement OpenCL quickly. Whereas, for example, CUDA is relatively simple, only has to target single vendors, so they can optimize that highly just implement the minimum things to do what they need to do without having to handle other vendors' requirements. Right, so CUDA. CUDA is tempting because it already works with PyTorch. It's kind of a de facto standard for machine learning GPUs. I would say the main challenge here is how to defend against uh, cease and desist from NVIDIA, right, because it's their IP. And another challenge which sort of goes hand in hand with this is I don't like to, I, I avoid, if I'm working on anything where I'm doing like open source using CUDA, like I have a project, I have an open source project called Coriander where I take CUDA kernels and then I compile them into OpenCL. Now, this sort of works. A challenge I found was that I didn't feel that I had the right to read the CUDA API docs. So the only way I could learn about the CUDA API was by reading other programs that used CUDA and therefore by, for compatibility purposes, I feel that I have a fair use to look at how they're using the API, but obviously this is very convoluted and quite hard. So, right, so I'm avoiding CUDA here. I mean, I nearly chose CUDA, but like AMD HIP, so AMD HIP is basically CUDA API, but all the words CUDA are replaced by like HIP in all of the API calls. So it's basically the similar API, but just with slightly different names. It's open source under an MIT license. It's already supported by PyTorch. It's very similar to CUDA. I feel that there's not much risk of being sent to cease and desist by NVIDIA. If they were going to do that, they would already do that to AMD. Even if NVIDIA did that to me, I feel that AMD might help pay for my defense. Because if I had to retract mine, then that would be evidence that AMD would have to retract theirs. All right, so I'm choosing AMD here. 
uh, it's sort of a compromise decision, but I feel like it's open source. It's, it's already sort of supported by PyTorch, and there's little IP litigation risk, uh, relatively small IP litigation risk, I feel. All right, I said choice in design. So using risk, risk B, this is very popular recently. Many projects are using it. It's very nice to use. I'm, I'm enjoying using it. I'm using the ZFINX extension so that we unify the float and the integer register file. We might need to break with BISC V in order to migrate to the Blame Float 16. Now, there might be an extension already for Blame Float 16. If there is, that's good. I want to know about that. Uh, I haven't found one yet, although I haven't searched incredibly hard, I have to say. But yeah, if you know of an extension, otherwise I might have to create my own extension, maybe potentially. But I will probably have to, therefore, modify like LLVM and all of these things in order to handle the extent. All right, how to handle DDR memory and PCIe link. Right, so I don't want the DDR controller and the PCI interface to be in very GPU. I feel that these are standard components and I feel that the appropriate way to handle these is to just drop in some third party IP. So whoever takes the GPU out, they can get hold of a third-party IP controller for DDR and an interface for PCI just drop those into the design. I feel that um, getting hold of a GPU, that's kind of challenging. Getting hold of a GPU design that's verified, etc., that's kind of challenging. But getting hold of a DDR controller, PCI interface, I feel there should be some out there um, and they can just be dropped into the design. I don't see any point in, in like bundling those in with the very GPU, so keep those factorized out. As far as how to talk with those, so I'm going to use Axie 4 because this is a fairly standard interface in industry. Uh, however, it seems like Axie 4 is not sufficient to fully specify the interface as far as I can tell. So there's probably still going to be some controller specific integration somehow. Uh, if anyone knows like a standard way of interfacing with DDR memory controller and PCI interface, I, I would be very interested to know that. As far as I know, there will be some controller-specific integration. Uh, do we need network on our chips? So I'm reliably informed that yes, we do. However, I'm not sure about this. Like, I feel that the GPU is sufficiently hierarchical that maybe we don't need network on a chip. But like all of the cores, they sit in a compute unit. So the cores communicate with the compute unit, communi compute unit communicates with units above that. So I'm not sure that we need the network on a chip. I'm not sure. I'll see. I'll find out. So what's working? So single source compilation works. So you can write some C++ that contains a GPU kernel. You can compile that. That kernel can then be run on the simulated GPU. This all works today. Um, the compilation is using Clang LLVM to split out the GPU kernel from the host side code and then compile that kernel into RISC-V. We need to provide a runtime library, and I'm providing a, a, a HIP compatible runtime library. The HIP runtime library handles things like virtual memory allocation for the GPU, uh, transferring data to and from the GPU, transferring the kernel to the GPU, and launching the kernel. So this exists today, this works today. A basic GPU core. So we've got a basic GPU core. It's using the RISC-V ISA. It's got ancient FB32 arithmetic. It's got a relatively fast propagation delay, I feel. Uh, things that, um, <clears throat> that we need to add in are instruction parallelism, we currently don't have. Don't have. Uh, caching, we need to add in caching. Currently it's using FB32. We need to migrate to the brain flow 16. And there's some floating point operations we need to add, specifically exponential, logarithm, and tan tanher, maybe a couple of others. Things we don't need or want, we don't want super scalar execution because this uses absolute tons of dice bit. This is great because then we don't have to implement super scalar execution. So we don't need to do out of order or, any, or micro operations or any of these things. Right? That's gone. So it's relatively simple. We want the GPU core to be relatively simple because then it takes up a small amount of put die error. We're going to have thousands of these on the GPU die. So they all have to be relatively small and simple. So this makes our life easier. Uh, GPU controller. So the GPU, GPU controller sits on the GPU die and that communicates with the host side run side library, runtime library. Um, it handles copying data between the GPU global memory and host side memory in either direction, um, sending kernels to the GPU compute unit and launching them. So that's working today. PyTorch to do. So PyTorch is compiled for AMD. Well, it's compiled for CUDA and you can also compile it for AMD here. 
when it's compiled for AMD HIP, the kernels are compiled into the AMD ISA. So those won't run on our GPU because we leave them compiled to the risk v ISA. Now, more or less, what we just need to do is to recompile PyTorch using our own <coughs> runtime and libraries. However, we need to create those libraries so that when we compile PyTorch, it will compile into RISC-V. This needs a bit of tweaking and hacking around. I've done something similar because in my project where I took CUDA kernels and compiled those into OpenCL, it's kind of similar, actually harder, so this is easier than that. It's doable, but it will need a certain amount of time. It's not just like an hour of like typing dot slash configure or something like that. There will actually need to be some modifications in head files and definitions created and, and modified and so on in order to do this. But it, it's doable. All right, so verification. So if we want people to take this out, spend millions of dollars on it, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars, we need to show that it's going to work. Right? It's not enough just to write some code and say, well, I guess it works. We need to prove or make it very certain that if it's taped out, it's actually going to run. Um, in industry, 80% of development effort slash money slash time goes into verification, not into writing the code. And creating unit tests as I go along, they all run currently in Icarus Verilog. Um, and then some, some of these have been ported to Verilator. I'm sort of porting more and more as I go. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I face so far is uninitialized X values. These are quite hard to detect, I find. Uh, one way to detect them is to use gate level simulation with iVerilog. This catches quite a few, but not all. Uh, I always experiment with using like asserts with iVerilog. That also catches some, but again, not all. There's many edge cases and corner cases. What I'm finding works quite reliably is random initialization with Verilator. So Verilator can, whenever there's some new wire created, it, it, you can tell it, all right, just initialize it with a random value. So sometimes it'll be zero, sometimes it'll be off. If you run it enough times with the random initialization, a failure to initialize will manifest in a fail, failing unit. These failures can be hard to track down, but at least we know there's a bug to fix. I feel it's vastly preferable to know there's a bug somewhere and to have to spend some time tracking that down compared to not knowing there's a bug at all. And if we run the test many times and we don't manifest any bugs, then we can be reasonably confident that the initializations are working okay. Not entirely 100% because there's a sort of like probabilistic element here, but I feel that it works fairly well. All right, so unit tests and initialization. Uh, all right, performance. So there's three measures of performance that we care about. One is propagation delay, one is die area, and one is cycle count. So propagation delay is the time for the, at each clock cycle, um, any changes in flip-flops inputs has to propagate through our combinatorial logic, and that takes a certain amount of time, which is the propagation delay. The propagation delay uh, controls how fast we can set our clock speed. So the the faster the propagation delay, the higher the clock speed we can use and the faster we can run our GPU. The cycle count is the number of cycles to run a particular instruction. So the cycle count combined with the propagation delay basically decides how fast our GPU is going to run. And then die area factors factorizes into cost. Like the, the more die area, the higher the cost of taping out and the lower the yield. So the smaller the die area, yield goes up, cost of taping out goes down. So overall cost goes down. For the propagation delay and the die area, so I believe that you can use like OpenStar slash timer to do this. However, I wasn't able to figure out how to get that working. I sort of tried it, but I didn't figure out. What I'm doing is I'm using YoSys to synthesize down to a gate level netlist. I'm not doing layout here. I'm using the structure of the logic gates, like the network of logic gates as a proxy for how much, how much time will be in the propagation delay and, and the diary. But this doesn't take into account things like wire lengths and layout. So it's just a proxy. To actually get the actual exact propagation delay and diary, I would need to run layout, which I'm currently not doing, but will obviously do in the future. So I'm using doses to synthesize down to a gate level analyst. I'm using an open source 90 nanometer cell library called SAD. EDK90 to do this. This is provided by Synopsis, which is very nice. 
of them. But yeah, it's open source, it's, it's not IP encumbered, so we can freely use that. And then what I'm doing is I'm, well, I have a custom script that walks the netlist. And what I'm doing is I'm calculating propagation delay in units of NAND gate propagation delay. All right, so what is NAND gate propagation delay? It's the propagation delay of a single NAND gate. So if we have one NAND gate, then the NAND gate propagation delay is one. If we have two NAND gates, one after the other, then it's two. If we had a NAND gate followed by a NOT gate, so a NOT gate propagation delay is about 0 0.6 times a NAND gate propagation delay. So a NAND followed by a NOT is about 1.6 NAND gate propagation delay. And this should be fairly node technology independent, like whether we're using five nanometer or 90 nanometer, a NOT gate is about 0 0.6 the propagation delay of a NAND gate. Not exactly, but approximately ballpark. So basically, by calculation of like NAND gate propagation delay, is I feel it feel a fairly reasonable proxy to be able to judge, okay, this implementation is faster than this. I don't know the exact propagation delay, and depending on layout, like actually the relative rankings might not be quite the same, but hopefully it's a reasonable proxy to be able to choose a faster circuit over a slower circuit. And similarly, for the diarrhea, I calculate in terms of NAND gate diarrhea. So if we've got two NAND gates, that's two NAND gate diarrhea. So again, we're not doing layout, we're not taking into account wires, and we're not taking into account like power lines. Okay, but I feel it might be a reasonable proxy uh, in order to get some indication of propagation delay and diarrhea. And then cycle count is easy to measure, it's just the number of clock cycles for particular test programs. So we run a test program like say matrix multiplication and how many clock cycles does that take? All right, so this is performance. Uh, so all of these like tests run on a CI server using CircleCI, which is free for open source projects. Basically every commit, it runs the, it calculates the, measures the propagation delay, the diarrhea, and the cycle count as well as running the unit tests for the verification. Uh, we actually have like integration tests and stuff too. Uh, all right, what open source tooling am I using? So I'm using Icarus Verilog, which is a simulator, Verilator, which is another simulator, and Yosis, which is a synthesizer. So what are the good and bad points about these? So Icarus Verilog is, is very easy to use. Uh, it generates compiles code very quickly, and you can write test cases in Verilog, which is super nice. Bad points is it has limited support for system Verilog. So I, I feel that it was written a while ago, and it hasn't been updated much for system Verilog. It's got a strict GPL v2 license. Now, this is not an issue if we're only using Verilog. However, I want to be running simulations from PyTorch, from C++, which means I need to link my C++ code or the PyTorch code to the iVerilog library. If we need to link this together and the library is GPLv2, that means my code needs to be GPLv2 too. I want my code to be under a more open license at MIT, so I want to avoid linking with the GPLv2 iVerilog library. Um, it's also unclear to me how to guarantee detection of initialization errors when we're using iVerilog. Now moving on to Verilator. Good points of Verilator. It's got a really great reputation in industry. It runs quickly. Now I say it runs quickly. It compiles and generates relatively slowly, but once it's compiled and generated, it runs quickly. You've got a relatively unrestricted license, the lesser GPLv2. So we can freely link to LGPLv2 code without our code needing itself to be LGPLv2. So this is great for VPI uh, linking with C++. I find that it detects initialization errors reliably using the random initialization. It's easy to link with C++, which is great for when we're running like PyTorch against our simulated GPU and system Verilog support is underway. Bad points, so the system Verilog support is still in progress. Uh, compilation generation is fairly slow, and it's hard to configure. Like you have to set up some files, a whole bunch of code, in order to run anything at all, compared to iVerilog, where you can just run it on the command line. It's super easy. Um, and you can't create standard Verilog test bench unit tests. Now, you can kind of tweak, hack around your Verilog so that most of your testing IP is in Verilog, and then the C++ is just a very thin shell on top of that. However, you end up with the, the resulting Verilog code is not as intuitive to understand and to read it to maintain as if the whole thing is written in Verilog. That said, because of the advantages of Verilator, the relatively unrestricted license, and the detection of the initialization errors, I'm gradually moving my tests into Verilator and moving into Verilator. 
And then Yoast is a synthesizer. So Yoast is a really amazing synthesizer. Like, it's awesome. I haven't discovered a bug in it yet. Right? Sometimes I find a bug and I'm like, oh, I finally found, I found a bug in Yoast. But it's always a bug in my own code. It's always something I've done wrong in my own code. So yeah, Yoast just works really well. It's very reliable. Uh, it can handle a very diverse space of Verilog code. It doesn't handle system Verilog, so you have to feed it Verilog. But if you feed it Verilog, it can handle like a diverse space of Verilog. Um, if it can't handle something, it will say, it will say, oh, I can't handle that. It won't just give you the wrong answer. So either it will give you the right answer, which is the vast majority of the time, or it will say, oh, I can't handle that input, you need to change it. And it will tell you approximately what you need to change. Bad points, as for all of these tools, uh, limited support for system Verilog. Right, now there's some tooling I tried, but I haven't used yet. So one is OpenStar Timer, uh, one is SVTV, and one is Qflow. So OpenStar Timer, like, as far as I know, it can be used to measure the propagation delay. It might also handle layout, I'm not sure. Anyway, I couldn't like, get it to work. Maybe I'm using it wrongly, but it, I couldn't get it to work for myself. So yeah, so I'm not using that currently, but maybe in the future. SVTV, so SVTV is very nice. Uh, Project. It takes system Verilog and it converts it into Verilog. So then we can then feed that Verilog into all these other tools that only support Verilog. So the good point is it works with system Verilog. Bad point is when something goes wrong, it dumps you into the generated Verilog. So when I have an error, I get dumped into generated code that I didn't write. So I have two sets of code, the system Verilog that I wrote and know intimately and understand very well. And then whenever I get an error, I get dumped into code I didn't write and that's generated, which is quite challenging. I sort of tried that for a while, but personally, currently, I find it more effort to deal with the dual code than to simply write everything in Verilog, keep everything in Verilog, the sort of lowest common denominator across all the tools I'm using. But I do like the idea of SVTV. I feel it would be nice if, uh, it, it would be really nice if SVTV could do what it does and then somehow dump you into the system Verilog when there's an error, along with a system Verilog related error, rather than dumping into the generated Verilog, maybe. Uh, Qflow. So Qflow is a is a layout software. As far as I know, it's the only open source layout tool. Uh, although it may be OpenStar Timer handles layout too. I'm not sure. Uh, bad points. I couldn't. I found it hard to use. I tried it with like a very simple example, like one NAND gate or something like that, and I and I couldn't get it to work. So I'm probably just using it wrongly. But yeah, like I, I, I'm not using it currently. I will probably use it in the future and figure out how to use it because basically, as far as I know, it's the only open source layout tool. So gaps and opportunities for open source. So system bear lot support. So I need a DDR5.6 controller and a PCI interface. A BMAN block generator. So as far as I know, all BMAN block generators are all provided by the foundry. Now I'm wondering if there's a way that we could have like an open source BMAN block generator, which is somehow foundry independent. I don't know if this is possible, but like we have like these languages that support creating like logic gates that become like logic cells, which then get changed into the foundry stuff. Uh, I wonder if we can do something similar for BMAN block generator. I don't know, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. And an easy to run chip layout generator. All right, so system Verilog support, this could be adding support to existing tools. It could be uh, tweaking SVTV so the workflow stays within the system Verilog code. DDR5 and 6 controller. Uh, so ideally with a full verification suite. So when someone takes out the chip, they don't want to just take a, a DDR controller that has just been developed a bit, and there's no guarantee that that's going to work, because 80% like of development effort for ASICs is on verification. So if they have to write the verification themselves, like that's 80% of the development. So that's a significant burden and a significant obstacle. So it does need to have a full verification suite. We want to have a standard interface as possible, e.g. using Axie 4, and ideally, we should have some, some kind of proxy module for running simulations, right? We shouldn't have to run the full DDR controller PCI interface when we're just running simulations. We should be able to bypass that for simulations, at least for when we're simulating a whole like, end-to-end -end system. Uh, Beam Empock generator, is this possible in open source? I don't know. But, like, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. Like, is there a way to do this? Uh, easy to run chip layout generator. So this might be as simple as adding documentation to Qflow. Uh, but I think there might be a need for some some test cases, though, uh, because I, I mean, I, I hit issues very quickly and easily, but I might be just using it wrongly. All right, so thank you for listening.
very GPU aims to be an open source GPU ASIC dedicated to machine learning. It's got an extensive verification suite, like unit tests, integration tests, etc. We're calculating performance metrics for die area, propagation delay, and cycle count, and it's dedicated to machine learning. So we intend to use only Rainflow 16 in order to keep the die area low and the yield high. We intend to implement only voting point operations needed by ML, and we intend to ensure that it works with PyTorch. Cool. Thank you for listening. Hey. Are you still with us? Hello? Uh, yeah, I'm still here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. sorry, sorry, because we're some having some problems here, so I was wonder I was very afraid that you were disconnected from us. Okay, so do anyone here have any questions? Okay, so anyone here have any questions? Okay, so anyone here have any questions? Okay, so maybe we, we need to give them give them some time to think think about what they want to ask. But I, I have a question I want to ask with you that uh, comparing to your work, like uh, there are many plenty of uh, open source GPU implementations regarding the GPU GPU one such as the M A I uh, sorry M I A O W the Miao you know the from uh, I believe believe is from some university in the in, in America, and there is a in New Z, the N U N Y U Z I, which is inspired by the uh, failed Intel Lara Lara B, I, I believe. So, what is the design comparison bet bet between theirs and yours? Because sim simply, the, uh, because apparently uh, your design is based on uh, restart instruction set architecture instead of the existing and proven ones. So, this is my question. And Please, uh, if, 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 if you allow me to, <laughs> to, 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 yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm not very familiar with the other uh, open source CPU out there. Um, there's, there's one called Vortex, which I believe is targeting FPGAs, um, and I'm not familiar with the other one that you mentioned. I see, I see, okay. So, um, so th I have another question that is uh, kind of uh, straight away as well, but I, I'm really curious about that. Uh, you know, uh, back in maybe uh, one year or two years ago, there is another uh, group of people who would like to develop their own GPU based on the RISC-V instructions, RISC-V ISA. So, but they chose to use the open power instead in, in the any hand. So, may I ask why do you want to use RISC-V ISA as your base? I know that is it's very new, it's very cool, but uh, what is your concern here? Uh, so your question is why I'm using RISC-V rather than some other ISA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, it just seems like a natural ISA to use because it's out there, it's open source, and like lots of projects are using it. Um, and I haven't come across any major issues with using it so far. I mean, the main issue that I will come across is the fact that I haven't found an extension for BF16 for the risk fee. Uh, but it, it seems like it's got a lot of tooling support in general. Uh, so, like, what other ISAs would you think might be a good fit instead of RISC-V? Well, I'm not very sure, but some people are actually implementing their own uh, GPU, GPU based on, I believe, it's ARM-based, which is uh, which is some kind of uh, risky because you know they ARM um, won't be happy that you're in trying to re-implement their ISAs. But I know there are some groundworks there, but yeah, that's. Some some kind of <laughs> the, the try, <laughs> anyways. Uh, so yeah, here we are, we have questions here. Please come come here because the 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 camera feed is here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey, hi, thanks you for your presentation. Yeah, it is pretty significant. Like uh, your uh, uh, GPU support the uh, PyTorch framework. Yeah, and I'm a bit interested that yeah, since we have uh, since PyTorch is a large framework and it uh, incorporates with Python and yeah, we also have uh, something like Unix or yeah, more static model that doesn't require a lot of uh, framework or a lot a lot of layer on top of that. Yeah, and it also describes the whole AI model. Yeah, so yeah, since you are targeting in machine learning, so have you ever considered or 
Yeah, I would like to ask what is the benefit to support the whole PyTorch layer instead of just Onyx or any static model format? Yeah. Yeah. So here, here's the problem, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the question is, why am I targeting PyTorch rather than Onyx? Yeah. Is that, is yeah. that the question? Yeah, for... Um, mm. I guess I haven't thought about that question. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes. So, uh, so maybe this is a kind of profound impression that yeah. maybe you can... You can think about it and then maybe give us a reply <laughs> in one day or two or, or you know, in any time you want, okay. would like to do that. Sorry, that uh, because uh, there are many yeah. kind of uh, DOAs here in Taiwan that yeah. and many DOA makers trying to do their own works, but just like the, the people, the, the person here that uh, many of them are targeted in the static models instead of the PyTorch or, you know, the TF Live because it requires the, inter, the, the, the interpreter, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, this is some kind of... Uh, but anyways, this is open source. You can try to use it <laughs> and try yeah, to yeah. do your own work know, based on it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. I mean, I guess so the on Onyx is for inference, right? Whereas I'm targeting training. Oh, so right. is that maybe the difference? Okay. I see. So basically, the open GPU or the very GPU here is stuck it in the you know yeah, bot, yeah, bot yeah, training. Yeah, yeah, but on the edge training, and oh. that's the way that we yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Like, I feel there's, there's a lot of work for inference, but um, for training, I'm, yeah, so, so, but, yeah, that was, I think that's, that, that's the reason, yeah. I, think. I see, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions here? If not, uh, I, I still have a question here. <laughs> here, so I'm, I'm curious that you're using very later for the, you know, this emulation, but uh, how is the speed that you're, your, your experience in because you know very is uh, if I remember correctly they are adding the multi-thread support for the emulation but it's very buggy from my experience so did you use the multi-thread emulation or did you do just use the single thread uh, emulation model uh, uh, currently I'm just using the single thread and I'm not yet using the multi-thread I haven't tried multi-thread yet okay I see it was, uh, maybe Okay, I see, I see. Uh, just a, one moment. I, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak in Mandarin to ask some people around here. That's <laughs> So Hugh, that uh, a person here that is actually our next speaker is will, will be presenting the, his own experience on the very leader, and he's quite curious about your experience on using. Uh, that's only SVA, uh, the, the SVA in the the later. So I'm I'm not very familiar with that, but he he mentions about it, and he 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 wonder how's your experience on the SVA in the very later. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't remember what is SVA. Can you tell? Can you remind me what is SVA? Okay, I will ask him. How does SVA is my It's the variable assertion. Okay, it's it is the system variable assertion. Okay, it's so a system variable assertion. Uh, I'm just using the normal uh, variable assertions. I'm not using uh, assertions on the C plus plus side. I, I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the for the for the, for the answering. And uh, just one more. I'm very curious about that. Do anyone fund you to actually tape it out? And you know there, are, uh, you know there's a chip bill that is passed in America. So I'm wondering that will you be interested in using you know the 90 nanometer process node or 100 130 nanometers process node from Skywater to tape out your you know the very GPU. Uh, I haven't targeted finding funding yet. I think that's something for the future. Like once I've got more of a, once once it's more fleshed out and ready for taping out, then I will look into taping out and finding funding at that point, but not yet. I see. Well, that's, your, your talk is actually uh, kind of repo here in Taiwan, so 
I will definitely forward some interested parties to you, and we will be looking forward to it. And it's about time, so thank you very much for joining us, and sorry for waking you up so late in the in the United States. And bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening. We lost track of time. Hey, <笑>哦然后我叫戴周然后其实我原本是一个自工系学生后来跑去瑞玉做RTO的时候然后就是有点算是我平常休闲的兴趣吧然后过去两年我们在CoSCup就是这个一层轨我们讲了很多开源音体
。然后这是我熬来，我为大家讲一下 r e a t 这个好用的工具，还有它的局限性。然后就它其实就是一根钓竿，然后看你可以钓什么鱼，然后底下就讲两个鱼，当我们的范例这样。然后我们稍微 review 一下，呃 ，IC d e s i g n flow 啊，这个是从一个叫阿妈也懂的 IC d e s i g n flow 那边借过来的，你各位可以上去 YouTube 上去找他的讲解。啊，然后这个是过度简化流程，就是、啊、如果你直接照这五个步骤做，应该会浪费沙子这样。好，然后首先第一步是我应该开个镭射笔。好，第一步就是 spec 嘛，例如说我们要准备量 respect spec 这个东西，然后接下来你就喂给工程师喝咖啡，他就帮你转成 RTO code， 例如说就是你的 micro architecture。啊，这个阶段我们通常会写 code 会有点类似 A 等于 A 加 B 这种，又称为 v e r i a b l e behavior model 的那种层级。然后这个阶段通常会验证你的方选有没有对嘛。然后最常用的方法就是 simulation。啊，当然还有其他的招式，那我们这边就先不提。然后。呃，你验证你功能都对之后，就要做合成。合成完之后，就合出 g a t e level list， 就是把那些 A 等于 A 加 B 没拼成多几杂，然后再做 gate simulation， 确定你合的有没有呃正确或错误这样。然后最后就是进入 APR 的流程，哦，就 p r a s e and run， 然后我们俗称 APR。对，然后做完之后就做 post simulation， 然后产生 GDS two 给台积电生产这样。啊，但是如果我们现在要走一个全开源的流程，大概要怎么做呢？首先，我们在 simulation 部分就有两个选项，其实前面有讲者有稍微提过，就是 b r e a t e r 跟 i b e r o g 然后后面后段的话，就是去年有人讲过，就是 Open Learn， 就是可以一步到底全部走完，这样。然后我们再细看一下 pre simulation 这个阶段，就是一般来说我们常用的常用 tool 就是那三大家公司出的嘛，那三大家 i d e company 出的 tool。然后这些都是闭源的，而且要钱的。那如果你要用一些闭源，但是可能稍微免费的话，例如说赛灵思的 B 8斗，现在叫 VTS， 它有提供 Web Pack License， 就是可以去呃免费的让你去模拟。但是我不确定它局限性到到底在哪里。这样，然后像其他像 Intel、Quartz 那边也有之类的工具。啊 ，Open Source 的话就是我们刚刚提到 i b e r o g 跟 b r e a t e r 然后简介一下 b r e a t e r 它目前是目前号称最快的 v e r o g 跟 s y s t e m v e r o g 的 simulator， 但你讲它叫 simulator 很不正确，它应该叫 compiler。它实际上就是把 v e r o g 跟 s y s t e m v e r o g compile 成呃 C 跟 C 加加或是 C 乘 C， 然后接下来再跟你自己写的 test bench 用 C 加写 test bench 一起编编成你的 simulator。然后它目前 license 是 Open GPL L GPL V 三，就是比较宽松版本，就是。呃，你喂进去给他吃的东西是还是属于你的。然后另外它有一个 license 叫做 Pearl Artistic License， 就是它卷出来的东西也是你的。但是 Beretta 有一个呃要注意的地方，就是它不只是个 compiler， 它也是一个 l a c e library 的东西，就是它有一些 header。啊，那 header 如果你把它包进你的 project 里，那就会受到 LGPL 的约束。这样。然后它目前已经有二十五年的历史，主要做的是 Wilson Snyder 还有。呃，几十位很活跃的开发者跟上百位的呃 contributor 这样，他目前被 Linux Foundation 底下去 alliance 去类似让这个社群更加繁荣。所以自从加入之后，他的 commit 数量我这边没有图，你可以去他的呃社群看他的 commit 数量大幅成长。然后再就是因为 r e s p i r 现在很红嘛，很多开源的 project 都用 b e r e t a 基本上你所有看到路上看到 r e s p i r open source 的 project。都有提供 b e r e t a 这个 solution， 然后它在业界也很常被使用，像这是 b e r e t a 官网上写的，让 Intel、AMD 跟特斯拉之类的大公司都有用。啊，特斯拉的话，其实它在三年前的 Hard Chip 大会上有讲过，他们使用这个 b e r e t a 去开发他们 FSD 晶片的经验，各位有兴趣可以去找找看。然后学界也很多人在用，像 ETH 力，就是苏黎世理工大学或是东京大学，国内其实。据我所知，也不少学校有在用，然后甚至有一些，因为他现在业界有在用嘛，所以有些公司也提供他的 commercial support， 就三四家这样。然后它的特色的话，主要就是它 simulation 资源就是 Bell 跟 c s m b e l l 然后 c s m b e l l 不是全部资源，主要局限在可合成的
语法部分啊，详细的话就看 document， 因为它有些语法就不支援，所以还是要 check 一下。然后它不只可以模拟，它模拟还可以产生波形给你 bug。然后再它就是支援 syntax check， 就是 linting 嘛，还有 coding style 的检查，例如说 unused block d e t e c t i o n 之类的。然后也支援 C 层 bug 的 DPI 跟。比较旧的 Verilog 的 BPI 这样，啊，建议用 DPI 啊。然后再來就是 Core Coverage 部分，它支援 Line Coverage、Assertion Coverage 跟 Toggle Coverage， 但是不支援呃 Arc、Transition 跟 State。然后它支援哦 ，Sorry， 它支援简单的 C s m Verilog Assertion， 就是不是完整支援，因为 C s m Verilog Assertion 蛮多很花俏的语法，主要支援就是 Stable 或落实这种比较基本的语法这样。然后通常会有一个建议啊，就是你不管是用 Berate 还是用商用 Tool 都一样，就是你 SBA 写的越简单越好，你的 Performance 才会高。因为 SBA 如果你写的太 Expressive、太花俏的话，会拖慢整体的模拟效能。然后它像 Boost Support， 我查到就是 Throughout 跟 Until， 当然还有一些其他的。然后最后它一个呃很关键的特点就是它是 Cycle Based Simulation。啊，什么 Cycle Based Simulation 呢？像我们一般呃。B C S 或什么其他 tool 的 simulation， 它看的 evaluation， 它还是看它的。你 Verilog 上面不会写什么 time scale， 你的时间颗粒度是多少，就是以那个为基准。但是 v e r i t o r 的话，主要就是以 cycle。那 cycle 的时间颗粒度通常比你上面的 time scale 好像大一点，所以这情况下它的速度就会比较快。然后，可是因为这个呃特性，所以它就不支援那个 delay， 你就。Sharp delay 就会直接被无视这样，然后通常的话都吃只有吃一个 clock source， 当然有一些呃招式可以让它吃很多 clock source 之类的，呃后面会提到有个网站有教怎么做这个，然后所以在这个情况下，你把它拿来跑 post simulation 完全没有意义，因为它就不吃 delay， 它也不吃 SDF format， 所以你喂它吃这种 timing information 其实完全没有意义，但是这个特点造就的就是它超级快。啊，有多快呢？就是按照特斯拉那个演讲的说法，比商用 Tool 快了五十倍。好，然后接下来我们来看一下它的简单的 flow， 就是啊，你现在有一个 counter 点 B 嘛，就没有一个 code， 然后接下来你用 Berate 把它 compile 成 C 加加，还有一些相依的档案这样。接下来你就写一个呃 C 加里面的 function， 就是你的也是 test driver 的东西去 include 它。然后再把它编译一次，变成你的 executable simulator。啊，像这个就是它卷出来的结果，就大概这样。你可以发现有一大堆点 CPP 的呃东西。然后像这个黑的，就是你可以拿来 include 的部分。然后它如呃，你另外就是你必须要写一个一个 main function 去去呃类似初始化你的 variator 的 context 嘛。然后像上面这边就是那个 v e r i t o r header， 就是刚刚前面提到他自己有包几个他专属 header 这样。然后后面这段就是环境的建立，例如说你的微缝的 VCD 的那些 file 的呃建立这样。然后像讯号存取的话，就跟你一般写西加在存取 class 的 member 的方法一样，就是直接叫什么呃 R O sign 之类的。然后，所以啊，经过这个流程，然后就会跑编译完之后，就跑出你的呃可执行的模拟器。啊，这两页我们就跳过，因为这两个也很细。然后还有一个特点就是，它是一个 two state 的 simulator， 什么意思呢？一般我们 log 你宣告一个 register， 它有四个 state 嘛，就是零、一、e, unknown 跟 high impedance。但是 simulator 只支援零跟一、e, ，那你会问 unknown 跟 high impedance 跑是哪里呢？它就会被 mapping 成零或一，啊，这边零或一是，呃，你可以在模拟期间决定的。例如说，你可以在它你编译好后的 simulator 强迫它太零，像我这边是一个三十二 B 的 counter， 所以我太零嘛，所以就全部都是零。然后或者是这边是一个三十二 B counter， 全部太一，所以就是一堆 F， 或者是随便给值。那、啊、你可以问问，啊，我把 unknown 跟 high impedance 丢掉，那不就行为就错了吗？呃，对，会错，但是因为会错，还代表就是你的 code 应该是有问题的，因为 unknown 跟 high impedance 理论上应该不该被拿来做运算嘛，就是我们会有个术语叫 unknown propagation， 就是你 unknown 的值一直往后去下去做运算，啊，你后面结果就是错的。
然后这是它，呃，你看波形的话就可以用一个 O t o 的 Open Source 的 GTK w a v e 然后它吃 BCD 跟 FST， 这是两两个 v a r i a t o r 都支援的，呃 ，Format 这样。然后这是呃 c o d e c a r b a g e 的，呃，算小 Demo 吧。它用的是 Linux Test Project 底下的 LCOB， 就是它会把那个 Vector 你执行完后的那个 Coverage 的 Database 去呃解析成一个 HTML file 去给你呃看你的 Line Coverage 那些东西，这样。然后我觉得这页应该是这个讲这个讲题面最关键的部分，就是你现在可以忘记，但是这边记得要记得，对，就是我们会有一个建议，就是。b e r e t t a 好处就是它很快嘛，所以你可以用 b e r e t t a 快速的去提高你的 Turner 状态，就是，例如说你们要跑一个小时的 code， 那你可能跑一分钟就可以打到你要的那个 bug， 那这样你就可以很快速的 iteration 去提升你的开发效率。但是 b e r e t t a 也是有缺点，像它有时候会编出怪怪的行为，或者是，呃，它有时候会跑爆。对，然后所以这个时候你就需要商用的 tool 去 cover 剩下的部分，所以我们通常会说就是你用 Vector 去 cover 百分之九十八的 co 那个 bug， 用很快速的方式，但是你用商用的 tool 去 cover 剩下十趴，那这样的话就是可以大幅提升你的生产力，然后节省你的时间，然后又可以确保你的正确性。然后我们稍微呃复习一下我们在学校常学到的 r t o v e r i f i c a t i o n 的呃环境，大概就长这样嘛。就是左边蓝色框框是 p a t e n t 就是用来产生 test case， 然后喂给右边的 DUT， 就是 design on the test 啊，例如说你的 respect call， 然后 test phase 就是用来连接的部分。啊，当你现在你的 DUT 变成 CPU 的话，你就会遇到什么问题呢？例如说你的 m e m o r y port 会变成 AXI 或者 Tile Link， 或者是你会支援好多组。呃 m e r i p o d 然后再就是你要支援 Intel 或 d e b u g p o r t 然后再就是你的 p a t e n t 你的 p a t e n t 以 CPU 的话就会变成你的呃呃编译完的 code 嘛，啊，那、啊、你要怎么把它拿来喂给你的第三行的 test 呢？然后我们再来看第一个很简单很简单的 case， 然后这个 code 是叫 a k i l a 它是教大家开发的，目前是就是一个经典的 five stage 的。Core 这样，然后它目前可以合成，并在 R T 3 5 T 上去跑，然后支援 T C N 跟 D K G I K 去这几个呃记忆体，然后它目前是交大的计算微处理机系统原理原则与实作课程的教材，然后不是微算机系的那是另一堂课，然后呃课程内容主要就是让学生去改那个这个 Core Core 的 Code， 然后。跑上 Free Autos 去研究一下 OS 跟呃 CPU 之间的关系，这样，然后这边我就不细讲，可以去交大课程网页上去找找看，这样。然后这是它的比巴多的 Bra d a g o n 然后右边这三个子的部分都是赛灵斯 IP， 就是 NIG 这些东西都赛灵斯的黑盒子这样。然后左上角就是我们的 Core 啊，我们要模拟我们的 Core 嘛，可是我很懒惰，就是赛灵斯 IP。就黑盒子，我觉得那验它也没什么用，所以我就就无视它这样。然后我们的 interface A S I， 不过在内层里面还有一个更简单的呃 memory a c e s s p o s t 所以我们就直接拿这个来验就好了，就是偷懒这样。然后所以就就有右边这三颗，就是 I catch 的 I p o d 然后 D catch 的 D p o d 跟 I O p o d 这样。然后我们的 simple tag 就会变成这样，就是我们会白色框框内全部都是 log。用 Vue 写的，然后我们旁边造两个假的 Run， 就是用来存我们的程式嘛。然后它是一个突破假 Run， 就是让我们的 Core 可以去 Exit 它这样。然后再来就是有一个假的 u a t 就是它行为跟 u a t 一样，但是它不会对外 Output， 它就只是呃 Call 那个 Vue 的那个 Display 去让我们在 Console 印出 Hello World 这样。然后最后最外外框黑色的部分就是我们的 C 加加 main function， 就是它用来呃去产生 v e r i t o r 要的 clock 跟 r e c e s s i o n 哦，然后还有就是把程式码把 elf 转成那个记忆体的那些东西塞到我们的加润里面这样。然后这边就介绍一个 v e r i t o r 的 language extension 叫做 v e r i t o r public meta command。然后它用途就是把你的 register for while 或者是 function 或者 test 变成一个呃界面，在你的 C 加黑的中黑黑的中。然后其实这个东西真有有够方便，还有我一直用这个
，就是它长出来的东西就会类似这样。就是我们刚刚上面看到有一个叫 reward 跟 reward 的 function 嘛，啊，它就会被 mapping 到这边。就是你可以在 C 加加透过那个 method a s s 方式去 call 这些 function， 然后做你要的事情。然后我这边的用途是用来就是把资料写到那个假润里面。然后这是 a k i a 的 variable hierarchy， 就是你可以看到，就是 a k i a tetanus 底下这些都是 variable variable call， 啊，上面这个 top 就是我们 variable assign 的一个 top 这样，啊，这个 top 就是在这边被 assign 的。然后刚刚讲那个 hierarchy 的用途就是，你可以看到我们要 a s s 我们刚刚方选 a s s 的 hierarchy 跟。我们 variable hierarchy 是一模一样的，就是 top a k i a tetanus， 然后 mark run， 然后 write byte， 就是完全一样，它不会帮你做些什么奇怪的操作，就是很直观。然后再就是这边，我们新加那边方选这边还有稍微改了一下 respy i star simulator 的 l file load， 的就是让我们把 executable 的 l file 去 pass 成那个就是呃记忆体要怎么摆放，然后的资料这样。啊，这是执行结果，就是你可以发现，我们可以就是很简单的直接去 call 去吃我们的 L file， 然后就印出我们要的 Hello World 之类的东西。啊，用 C 加加当 test bench 有什么好处呢？第一个好处当然就是 C 加语法比 C 加 build 强大太多嘛，你有一大堆 STD library 可以用，什么 stack Q， 然后 priority Q 之类的，然后再就是它很好 link 其他 library。例如说，刚刚前面提到 L file load， 或者是 N c u r s e s 就是可以在 console 上印些有的没的，或者是你就绑一个 i n t r a c t i o n simulator 在里面，就你跑一步，然后就去比较一下你的 call 执行有没有正确，然后你绑一些分析的 tool， 还有另一个就是 retry from end server， 就是我们下一个主角，然后就是我们另一个 case， 然后这个 call 叫做 retry s o d o 它是 U C Berkeley Architecture Research 这个 group 开发的，然后他们也是，这也是一个教材，就是 U C Berkeley C S 一五二，应该是他们的 computer computer architecture 的教材，好像听说要用三个学期吧。然后它是用曲轴三写的，那曲轴三，呃，在后期会被转成 b e r g 然后喂给 b e r g 吃，就可以走我们后面的一般的流程这样。然后它资源一个 stage、两个 stage 到五个 stage， 就是因为这是一堂，这是一个教材。所以就是要让学生去学那个 computer architecture， 所以就这些很多的 config 这样，啊部分的 config 可以在 FPGA, FPGA 上跑，然后它目前不是一个 stand alone 的 project， 就是它需要有一个另一个 project 叫做 c h i p y a r d 它就有点类似一个 SOC template， 你可以把你的 code 塞到这个 c h i p y a r d 里面，然后就变成完整的一个 SOC 这样，然后只是因为 c h i p y a r d 稍微麻烦一点，我们如果你想要学。呃 r e s e a r c Sodo 的这个流程快一点的话，你可以选择有一个 branch 叫 Sodo O 的这个 branch， 它是一个 stand alone 版的版本，就是比较好学，环境也比较好架这样。然后再介绍一下 r e s p i r e from end server， 它是 r e s p i r e 早期的一个 tool 之一，就是一个原本是一个 stand alone 的 project， 后来被搬到 r e s p i r e ISA s c e n e 就是 Spike 的那个 repo 里面，然后它提供的功能就是。最主要就是 host target interface， 就是让你的，例如说现在这个 desktop 跟我的 simulator context 沟通，或者是 sim host 跟你的 DUT 沟通这样，啊，提供就是简单的功能，例如说 L file load， 然后程式的呃启动或停止，或者是载入，然后或者是有一个叫 predefined 的 communication register。就是 to host 跟 from host 啊，这个其实是一个后门啊。就是如果你要跑 respy test， 你需要把你的结果写到 to host 里面，让这个 from end server 知道说你的结果是成功还是失败。然后这是 respy s o d o 的 u m a t o r 的 bra d i a g o n 然后因为 respy s o d o 它支援 respy 的 debug space， 所以你可以放在它这边绿色有一个框框是 debug module， 然后透过那个 respy space 定的 DNI 接到那个 debug transport。module 也就是 s i n d t n 这边，然后这边外面会有一个用 s y s t e m b u i l d DPI 写的 s i n d t n 点 cc 的一个 function， 然后这个 function 就会去跟这个 DTN 对接，然后把 f o n t e n server 给的资讯喂给 core， 然后就可以达到我们刚刚 f o n t e n server 的功能这样。然后用 s y s t e m b u i l d DPI 好处就是因为它是 IEEE 标准嘛，所以。就是其他 tool 也是资源的，但是就是你的 
西加加那边可能还是要稍微改一下这样。然后这个 flow 是呃，它上面 license 上面写 sci-fi 啊，但是我不确定最原始的 flow 的那个 project 是哪一个，我猜是 Rocky t r i p e r 就如果有人知道原始，就最原始是哪个的话，可以告诉我。呃，啊，这是 r e s p i r e d e v i c e 边，你可以发现它就是把这块 DTN 的部分取代掉，变成新 DTN， 然后变成 DPI 去跟外面对接。啊，有些 flow 是把外面这个 d e b u g transport h a r w a y 就是例如说你的 JTAG 的 p o b 也取代掉，然后这样的话你就可以透过 remote vban 的方式去跟 OpenOCD 还有 GDB 对接。啊，这样你就可以用 GDB 去 debug 一个 code， 就很方便。啊，用这个 flow 的人最有名就是 Rocky t r i p e r 然后这刚刚的 simulation flow 啊，前半段就是因为 HTF 有提供那个 argument pass 的功能，所以呃前半段就是透过那个 reset f u n c t i o server 这边去载入你的程式，然后之后这边会有个 loop， 就是 v e r i t a c l a r k t i c k 的 loop。它用来的功能就是检查你扣有没有跑飞，再就是监控刚刚前面提到那个 to host 的 special register 去检查你的 display test 有没有跑对。然后很蛮多 project 用这个 flow 的，就最有名的应该就 Rocky t r i p e r 嘛，就是 r e s p i r e d demo 级的 project。然后它支援的就是两个，就是刚刚讲提到 DTN 的方法跟 JTAG 的方法。然后再就是 r e s p i r e d b o n r e s p i r e d b o n 就是 r e s p i r e d b o n 就是 r e s p i r e d 一个蛮有名的。o f f o r d 的实作，然后它目前不是 s t a n d a l o n e project， 它一样也是需要 t r i p l e 这个 framework， 啊 t r i p l e framework 就直接把刚刚说的这个 flow 包好了，然后再就是 ETH 力，就是苏黎世理工大学贡献给 Open Highway Group 的 CBA 六，啊，另一个名字叫 Arian， 然后它也用这个 flow， 然后另外它有一个特点就是它还跟一个叫卓美九的 r e s p i r b 六是 GC 的 emitter。做 code simulation， 这样。然后，呃，我主要讲的部分就大概到这边。然后，其实有些进阶的 topic 可以各位可以自己去去 study。就 Vector 其实很像可以跟 u b n 跑，但我不确定它可以跑怎么情况到怎么样，因为我不是做 DB 的。呃，然后 Vector 还可以吃 multi c l a r k source， 就是像这个网站 EIP CPU， 各位有兴趣可以去看。它很多，它是一家公司，应该是啊。然后的布洛格，然后他有很多 v e r i t a 很精确的讲解跟介绍，还有一些呃神奇的招式，对。然后上面这个网站就是 v e r i t a 的官网，然后它其实不止 v e r i t a 这个 project， 还有像 v e r y l o g Mode Pro， 反正就是一个好像是 e m a k e 的插件吧之类的。我记得有四个 project， 嗯，哦，然后我的报告就到这里。好。有。我怎么讲那么快？好。可以。收音的关系，请来。好。那个麦是是会会录起来。哎，你好。那我我原来在乐野是做 D V， <笑>所以我在问，现场问你，刚刚最后提到那个 v e r i t a with V U V 那个，现在目前是有。你今天在做了吗？还是说，呃，目前刚呃还没有人做这些东西这样，然后可能到什么，如果有的话到什么程度这样子？好奇，请问一下。到什么程度？<笑>但是我知道那个 project 已经起来，就是你在 Verite 那个 organization 的的那个 GitHub project 下有 Verite u v n 的的那个 project， 然后很像国外有一家公司在 Verite 的官网上讲了蛮多，就他对这个 tool u v n 的介绍还有实作，但是。因为我真的不是那个专家，所以我不太懂他在讲什么。嗯、呃，好，嗯，好，麻烦了，好，不好意思，不好意思，我们这个场地比较……呃，刚好就是我们有知道一些，就是关于 U V N 这边的，这样听得到吗？对，那它其实就是像刚才提到，就国外有一家公司是 Ant Micro， 那他们在致力于做 u v n 这一块。那其实接下来的话，就是你们如果眼睛尖一点的话，其实呃 v e l i t e 有新的 branch 叫 V 五，下一代的。那下一代的话，其实在在这个近期好像会推出。那他们其实就是往这个 u v n 去做做努力的，所以你们可以观察一下。对对对，补充一下。<笑>
<笑>我们在我们有在做这个，就是呃 f a l e t 的 service。对，那其实有兴趣的话，可以跟我们做讨论。那其实我们也会跟菲呃威尔森开会啦。所以刚才主讲者有讲到一个，就是呃 f a l e t Public， 这里也会出蛮多问题。<笑>对，那这个的话，其实威尔森有跟我们。讨论过用什么方法做比较好，所以如果就是在座有有兴趣的，可以也可以跟我们做一些交流。对对对对，好，谢谢。还有什么问题吗？好。喂，喂，那这边请就是想问一些问题。那对，那这个就是第一个，就是因为 v a r i a t o r 这个东西刚刚很明显，它 test bench 是 C 加加写的，那就是我们常常会遇到就是 IC 那边来的工程师，对，然后他们其实对写 C 加加 test bench 有非常大的抗拒感。<笑>那我想你也在 Re, Real Tech 哎、欸、Real Tech 工作嘛，那应该如果要在公司内推广，也是会遇到类似的问题。<笑>那想看看你对这个有什么看法？那。对，那第二个问题是，就是呃，因为在呃 IC House 里面，其实不会只验一个 CPU， 它里面每个小 component 理论上都应该会有验证。对，因为 end to end 来，只验 end to end 太弱了。对，那那个 tag tag 也不够多。那想请问，如果想用 Veritas 做这件事，你有什么建议呢？就大概是这两个问题，就是 sub module 的测试、啊，那以及就是 IC 工程师对于用 C 加加写 test bench 的抗拒感。好，对，谢谢。呃呃，关于抗拒感部分嘛，因为我是自工系出身的，所以我没有抗拒感。对，然后另一个问题的话，所以我就只能回答到这里。然后另一个问题的话就是，就如果你要做 unit test， 那就把 unit test 的 bug 切出来做验证，其实也是 OK 的。对，对，然后其实 unit test 好像蛮多其他的 project， 像有一个 project 叫 Coco TB， 一个用 Python trigger 的 unit test， 但是。我用太惯，因为我不太会写 Python 这样。嗯<笑>、呃。我还剩三分钟，如果快问题一分钟内可以解决的话，那你还有什么问题？好，要不然就在这里改成代中。啊。就代红中，他如果有需要的话，也前车也是可以找他联络。啊，我应该会在最近或是 b r a t o 的那个摊位这样。没带名片过来。那行吗？开玩笑，没有开玩笑，开玩笑，我只是说没带明天来而已。没有开玩笑，开玩笑，不用不用。好久不见。我之前被派过，我之前报复了讲说有睡不好。啊？睡不好？没有，那个前几周。对，对，吃太好嘛。那这样我就是改一改心理世界，比较健康，这样就 OK。但你你这一次来，我是一定要好好想办法补偿你的。对，因为我们看看是用什么方式可以以后再做。对。我问你哦，现在 Rich 派 CPU 啊，怎么去验证说它没有一些 speculative 的一些 bug， 就是像是什么 meltdown 啊，那那那些那些 speculative 之类的 bug。应该可以直接照着那个吧，就是你一定可以写出程，你现在都可以写出程，那个有没有？写出就写出打出 bug， 那就是 bug。还是？哦，是是是是，我有有有，我因为这这是真的搬到我两边这样两头烧，我真的没办法，因为我以不以后以后会那个尽量多，你们如果愿意来，那或者是愿意是方式，我我我是我是方式是指说就来给 talk， 他真的是很欢迎。对对对，只是因为这次真的是在是，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，
小组，因为我不是做后段，所以我有点太早。对，然后基本上在上场上，应该是有点小节奏。
关于后面那件折带更加。有有就我都已经没事了，因为那烟就那个桶鼻子折不出来了，就还是这么严重。然后咳嗽的时候就按烟筒，哎，怎样子？然后就就就放在这。人貌，人貌，我只有看过你。我是，讲到在昨天，对啊，你现在在干嘛？你的牌子在昨天的，就是昨天，是几天？他什么？那个换牌子，哦，换牌子，没有，对啊，就两个人换牌子，把它练了几次，从开始讲。我现在在那个，九月的时候去华盛顿大学前，然后也是做做发布会，就是我们那个 team 有做。我跟作者 respect， 然后叫我们来陪人。哦，我知道，我知道，我知道。那个是我们。哎 ，OK， 哎，他最近他们是不是要那个被 CBA 吸去了？就那个，我记得 Open Harvard 好像打算要去做这种长久的 adoption。我先看他们，谢谢你们。那个 group 好像就是有奇奇怪怪的人做各种不不是跟老师学，然后然后就炫耀。好像你有听过说，就是有要做这方面的事情，因为我们一定要做一个。一个小哥哥这样，然后其他其他哥在干嘛？因为我们都远距离，然后现在把快训练过，然后希望可以多一个机会，然后再多参与一下。其实我觉得，好多人也是就这样的，可能就是上班就多了。对，台湾要办这个，我要办到第二届，我死了，对，对，对，没几个人。去去年巅峰时期才三十个人在线上，超惨。看到这个就想到，我们原本以为那个就是，呃，那些英文讲师在讲说应该会大排长龙，然后就进来，为什么进步要抢在那个？我感觉把台湾弄一点太少了，一点都不够。整体走错路。对啊，整体走错路，因为前前一阵在金星，现在在塞班，走错路。我也是啊，我也我也把你。阿弟有的，今年今年就可以感受到那失败与痛。对，因为从头来讲，这两个特别觉得。可是你工作不就是压价吗？嗯，对啊。刚开的是压价，台湾其实这边目标完的情形，所以工作不是压价。然后还有几个公司 ，R I D O S， 其实台湾。你在做不是以前在做，对啊，老人家赛程是。所以那个你刚刚提到说，那 N C Q 有 N C Q 那赛程，就像是啊，是啊，是啊。哎、欸，阿 Falcon 说，我我有时候会讲 Falcon 的东西，因为我觉得他都太太难。OK， 我我我还跟我老板讲说，哎、欸，我们台湾有人喝那个奥罗佛的 Red Bull， 要不要来听一下？有人结果你没有讲，太羞愧了。下一个讲者的分工是明年，明年，明年，明年，明年，明年。哎，你们，我我真的有一次在找你老板，因为老板真的不知道为什么就。反正就是后来就不太回我信了，我不知道太忙还是怎样。没关系。对啊，然后找蔡守文过来讲啊，我说台湾也是，你好歹有在做 Linux 跟那个，就跑出来做预告还算不错看的。那个那个还不还是不错啊，不要这样的。哈哈哈哈哈。羞愧啊！哈哈哈哈哈。主要这个羞愧。我不确定一下时间，因为对还有两场，还有两分钟要走。OK， 那我们要离开。好，这家的东西。对，我不知道他怎么了。然后他就说：“我只求，然后所以已经要下一场了。”还是因为我在那边，还是我妈？好啊，那你帮我顾一下。好。哦。我看一下。Hi. I will present you Nexus 5, which is a recently developed out of order superscalar uh, softcore. So, a little bit of background first is that I'm mostly active on Spinal HDL, which is a hardware description library for Scala. Nexus 5, which is an um, in order softcore, and Nexus 5, which is the subject of this talk. And my background is both software and hardware, so I will mix really a bit uh, both worlds during this presentation. 
So next to Scribe, it is a 32-bit and 64-bit with Scribe core with a few extensions like multiply, atomic, single precision floating point, double precision floating point, compressed instruction set, supervisor, and user mode, which is more than enough to run Linux. Uh, like, for instance, uh, distribution like build root and so on. And it is also enough to run, at least enough to run Debian. So I'm currently working on that. Hopefully, it will work uh, in less than one month. So, and one of the main attributes of Disco is that it is not implemented in the Excel nor system very log. And instead, it uses uh, software. Um, software like it uses a general purpose programming language, like let's say it's like C or Python or Java. In the case of Nexus 5, it is Scala. So it uses Scala to elaborate the hardware and to build abstractions layer. And so you can find all the source code there uh, if you want to. And here is a, for instance, an example of the core running Doom in Linux in a reverse engineered oscilloscope at a quite decent frame rate of about 75 uh, frames per second. It is quite good for the platform, it isn't. So I didn't need that part, somebody else did it. You can find some information here. And so I will not go too deep in the architecture, uh, but I will give a few insights to, to get some feeling how this kind of core could work. So uh, let's start by saying, okay, in the core there is two decoder, which means the core, when it fetch instructions, it can read up to two instructions per cycle to push them further in the pipeline. Uh, three issue, which is how many instructions can start execution each cycle. Uh, and to do those three issues, there is three pipelines. One uh, shared execution unit here, which does things like address uh, generation unit for the load and store, multiply, divide, control status register to manage things like exception, uh, interrupt, uh, virtual memory, and this kind of things, and a few other specific instructions. And so this is a, a viable latency pipeline. And there is also two fixed latency pipelines which, which have a better latency, a faster wake up of depending uh, instructions. And those two pipelines are equivalent and they can do things like um, add, sub, shift, jump, and branch instructions. So in the core, there is a concept of a physical register in opposition to architectural register. So by, by architectural Architectural register, I mean that, for instance, when you write some assembly code, you will make reference to some register like add x1 and x2 and put that in the register x3. So those are architectural register. And here in the curve, I have more registers than this, so I have what we name physical register, which mostly allow the execution to go uh, much further, to, to not having to wait um, in many cases that the previous instructions are done. Kind of allowed to decouple uh, the instruction stream in a few cases. There is um, a reorder buffer, which is mostly something used to store uh, the context of the instructions in the pipeline. And so with 64 entry, you could have up to 64 instructions in flight in the pipeline. There is some branch prediction. I will, I will comment that uh, in the next slide. Um, quite important to have a, a good branch prediction because uh, this prediction penalty is quite high. It's about 10 cycles. If you compare that to an inorder core, it's about double the penalty, plus the fact that you, you lose all the things you already did in advance because you are in out of other cores, so you may track a lot of, a lot of useful work. Uh, there is a notion of having a non-blocking data cache, which means that if you access some memory which is not in the cache, okay, it will, it will uh, go to read that memory and fill the cache uh, with it, but it will not block the whole system. It will allow 
allow the system to have um, other access to the memory meanwhile. And so, yeah, I will just talk a bit about the branch prediction because it is a kind of an interesting topic. Not not saying that it is any anything groundbreaking in Nexus Five. I would say it's pretty standard. Um, but it is an interest, interesting thing still. So the branch prediction is done in multiple layers. The first layer is done in the fetch stage. So it's very early in the pipeline. And so the thing here is that <coughs> we don't have a lot of information to predict where the CPU should go next. We don't know the instruction we're executing yet because we are currently accessing the instruction cache in parallel. And <coughs> we don't know the data. For instance, if you have a branch if equals, we don't have access to the, we don't know the, the values that we have to compare to know if we have to branch or not. So we have to make prediction for those two things. And so in the case of NAX, uh, we predict which kind of instruction is in the world we fetch with the BTB. So for instance, if you tell us, okay, um, because we still have a few information here, we know which uh, address we are fetching, and we know as well the history of the last branches, like we know the history of the last 10 branches, if they branched or not. And so with those two information, uh, we can predict a few things, like, okay, maybe it is likely that the instruction at that given world is uh, branch if equals. And we also have to predict where this branch if equals uh, would branch if we take it. So, okay, first part of the prediction. And the second part of the prediction is done by the share, which is saying, okay, um, that branch in that world is very likely or not to branch, for instance. So it's a data prediction. So that's the first layer, which uh, we have a really fast response time. And then we have a second layer, which is then in the decode stage. And at that stage, we have a few more information. We, at that stage, we know exactly uh, the instruction that we are executing. We don't know the data yet, but we know, but we know the instruction, which allows us uh, for instance, if the BTB here told us there is no branch in that world here in the decode stage, second layer, we can correct that eventually if there is really a branch and told us before there is none. So we can correct a few things. Uh, we can also do some uh, better data prediction in the case of um, call, function call and function return. For instance, uh, return address stack is a stack structure in the hardware. When we do a call, we put something on it, and when we do a return from function, we pop something out of it. So that's the kind of improvement we can do here, and using that to do some production. And, and then, finally, for instance, in our execution unit, the job here is not to execute the branch, but it's more like to check. Because at that moment, we have everything you need. We, know, we have the instruction, we have the data. So at that moment, the job is to control, to check that the previous prediction did the job correctly, and if not the case, correct them. And finally then, when we commit the branch, commit mean like uh, we, we, are the, we can apply the side effect of the branch, at that moment, uh, we can learn. So there is kind of a, a loop allowing the branch prediction to, to learn from their mistake, for instance. And so, coming back to, the, to a more general view, abstraction doesn't mean overhead. Um, in the case of TCPU, it got quite some decent performance. Uh, keep in mind, it is, it is mostly made to be a software. And so it tried to fit well in a FPGA, and for instance, in a Arctic 7, it, quite, it, it get quite close to uh, in order software frequency. Still quite more resource usage, but it's 
not too much for, for, for that big design. And so now let, let's dive a little bit into how the how you can generate the CPU, how the generation of the CPU is made. So okay, you can go in the terminal, run this command line, then it will invoke the Nexus 5 elaboration. It is based on Scala as a general proposed programming language for the hardware elaboration. Spinal HDL, which is, as I said, a Scala hardware description library. And so this allows us to generate some VHDL and Verilog that we can then run some simulation and synthesis with the uh, flow uh, you are used to. And on the top of Scala and Spinal HDL, quite a few abstractions that I will now focus on the next slide. And so, uh, Scala, it is a good example of programming language, and here is an example how to write a hello world with it. So, oh yeah, okay, nothing fancy. And, okay, if you want to generate some very log file out of it, you could uh, use the file API of the language, uh, like, okay, opening a new file, writing stuff in it, string by string. But that's really not what we want to do, because this is, this is horrible to do. And, here is an example of the Spinal HDL API, where you can, for instance, import uh, the core, Spinal core, write a Scala name in which you invoke Spinal HDL to generate some Verilog of a given module. And then, okay, let's say we define A and B as input and sign 8 bits, and result as an output. Uh, with the value a to this b, and this will generate this uh, very long net list. And so, okay, um, let's try to, to let's look at this example, which is um, showing a bit the interaction between Scala and Spinal HDL, because could seems a bit weird to write this like that, why not directly writing uh, the Verilog uh, format? And so, yeah, here I will, I will show a bit the synergy between Scala and, and uh, Spanish DL. So, okay, let's define A, B, C as output side 8 bits. Okay, let's then define array as a array buffer of units. So, array buffer is a Scala thing. It's a mutable collection in Scala. And so you can store a reference to hardware signals of the netlist, like this, like, okay, you add A, B, C in our array. Then write, for instance, a for loop, which will iterate over all the elements of our array. And we will assign each of them to zero. And, and how you can see uh, here, the generated netlist will be kind of uh, unruled. Um, because Spinal HDL will only see the, the part of its API. Basically, Spinal HDL is not a compiler. Spinal HDL is it's the concept of having an internal domain-specific language, and it will register all the, car, all the call to its API you do. For instance, uh, you will see, okay, uh, here he wants a new module, okay, he will add it into the netlist. You will see here, okay, he wants uh, output unsigned. He will add them. And he will not see this array buffer because it is a Scala thing. He will not see the for loop, it's also a pure Scala thing, but he will see the side effect of those things. Like, okay, here, it's assigning element with zero, and he will generate this. So that's really the concept. Uh, you could use things like uh, hash map, dictionaries, uh, all sorts of data structures that you want to elaborate the hardware. And so, coming back to Naxxus 5, um, if you look at the design, there is a lot of pipeline, a bit everywhere. For instance, okay, there is one pipeline to fetch, one pipeline to decode, allocate, rename, and dispatch instructions, uh, one pipeline for each execution unit and quite a few pipelines in the load and store unit. Like one for the load, one to manage the address of the store, one to manage the data of the store, 
Once uh, those two things completed, there is another pipeline to, to apply some side effects and another pipeline to finally write back the data. I mean, yeah, there is a lot of pipeline, which is, which is maybe okay to write by hand if you, if you don't have to optimize a lot, if you, are, if you are really pretty sure of where you need to do what. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that I would say kind of never the case. Uh, you always need to optimize things to move uh, where in the pipeline you do some operations. And as well, quite often here, those pipelines are composed but with multiple uh, things in running in parallel. So you need to compose those pipelines with different things. And so what was done is a pipelining API uh, implemented on the top of Scala and Spinal FDL, where, for instance, here we define a module with A and B as input and signed, result as an output and signed. And then uh, we use our API to create a new pipeline and a few states like A, B, and C. So the states will be collected in the same order they are defined and with this connection type. Um, this M2 has been connect things with a register. So there, is, there will be, there, there is also other connections like uh, instead of a register, use a queue or maybe uh, directly connect wires from stage to stage um, as you want. And then, okay, we come here and okay, we we'll say in stage A, insert the value A plus B. And this will uh, provide us sum, but sum is not a signal. Sum is a key allowing to retrieve this result along the wall pipeline. So we can go in stage C and ask um, the hardware value of representing the sum key and assign that to results. And then, once we specified everything we need, we say, okay, pipeline, build yourself. And there you go. Um, the thing is, how it works internally, because here we have this build function. So how this kind of function is defined is, okay, pipeline is a class, um, and in this class, we have a list of stage. So, uh, Elaboration time list, and we have a build function. And what will do, what what will be done in this build function is like, for instance, we we'll iterate over every stages, figure out what they need, uh, where the things they need is generated, and generate the hardware required to connect all those things together. And for instance, what is a stage? Okay, it is a class, and here. We have uh, a hash map, like a, a dictionary, which will allow the stage uh, to link a given key, like the sum key we had before, to its hardware representation in that stage. So yeah, we are using an hash map to elaborate the hardware we need. And so back a bit to Nexus 5 now. Um, just a few, for instance, if you want to instantiate the CPU, you have a single parameter, which is a list of plugins. And this list of plugins, okay, it's a Scala array buffer, so a brush and time list of plugins. And in this plugin list, we will add like a plugin to manage the program counter, one to, to, to fetch uh, instructions, one to decode, one to dispatch, commit, and quite a few others. And so, those plugins, they are not uh, on-off switches. So wh one concept in Nexus 5 was to avoid having a big bloated top level where everything has to connect with everything it needs. And at, as soon you need to add something, you need to, you need to go in the spaghetti uh, mess to add a, a few modules, a few connections, and uh, it's really horrible. So. The concept in Nexus 5 is really instead to use this list of plugins. If you look at the top level Nexus 5 here, it's, it's mostly empty, it's just a few lines and do not generate any hardware by itself. But instead, um, each of those plugins contain and define the hardware which need to be added to the Nexus. And it also defines some negotiation 
with all the plugin to, to ask resources. I will, I will comment that later in the next slide. So, which makes things really flexible, like if you want to add an execution unit, like a ELU0, you come and you add an execution unit base, which is a skeleton of pipeline uh, execution unit, and, in, and then you can compose this skeleton with a few other plugins, which will uh, negotiate things with the execution unit base to implement their behavior, like adding add some instructions, adding shift instructions, branch instructions, and so on. And like if you want to add a second execution unit to, to, uh, to go faster with CPU, you just come and add another set of plugins with uh, another key, like ELU1. And yeah, things will compose themselves. And so, okay, let, let's try to look a bit what is a plugin. So it is a class. Okay, in the, ca in the case of branch plugin, we will use the branch plugin for the next slide. Uh, we need to know on which execution unit uh, we need to, to work on. So our construction parameter. And this class extends the plugin base class. So we have the concept of inheritance here, applied to hardware liberation, which allows us to define our early and a late uh, phase. So the early phase will be used to set up things like uh, we, we may ask to another plugin to provide us some interface, um, and the logic phase will be there to allow our plugin to generate some hardware. So, for instance, in the case of the branch plugin, uh, we need to do two things. We need to detect if there is, if there is a mispredicted branch and correct it. And we also need to do an exception, a trap, in the CPU if the branch is misaligned. And so to do that, we need a schedule interface uh, to, to put the CPU back on track. And the way we can get this interface, so yeah, it, it's not to wire thing in the top level by hand, but it's more, um, much more dynamic than this. So we will uh, use some API uh, from the plugin base class, which is like, uh, get the service which implement this software interface, commit service. So commit, interfa uh, commit service is an abstract class, so a software interface. And we can retrieve in the list of all the plugin, which one implements that software interface. Yeah, so like Kev has the base class service, the base class service, uh, each plugin is a service, uh, and there is a commit service, which is also a service, and you have the commit plugin, which is a plugin, and implement the commit service interface. So we really have a class here key um, for our hardware elaboration. And once we obtain uh, a reference to this commit service, we can ask him via the new schedule port function to, to provide us a new hardware interface for our own usage to put the CPU back on track. Uh, and we ask the interface to be capable to uh, jump and crap. So yeah, that's, that's the negotiation phase, for instance. And then the logic phase, and we generate uh, proper hardware to drive this interface with, uh, yeah, depending on the condition we detected. And yeah, we generate the netlist required to drive it. So um, instruction requirements. So, there was also the idea in the CPU that you could add its instructions easily in the pipeline without modifying uh, 10 files there and there and there. And so, for instance, in the case of the branch plugin, we need to specify that we will implement a branch uh, if equal instruction. And so the way we do that is we specify uh, what is a branch equal instruction. So, okay, it is a single decoding, whatever that is, and with a given opcode. So here is the bit mask representing the instruction uh, branch equal, and a list of resources like saying, okay, branch if equals uh, is using the integer register file register source one and two. It need to read the program counter, and it need to read the byte of the current instruction in byte. So yeah, here we define the instruction branch equal, and then what we can do is we can retrieve the execution unit base, which has the same execution unit IDs on us, 
So yeah, this is a bit the same pattern than before, but here we use a lambda function, like really a software thing to filter out, because uh, there may be multiple like, little unit bases in the list of plugin. And there is a, a function that you can call to add, uh, to specify to the community that uh, a given instruction is implemented in its pipeline by somebody, us, in this case. And so this will have quite a few cascading effects. Like one side effect it will have is the existing unit uh, will figure out that somebody needs to read, uh, needs the value of the integer of the file as one as two and need, need the program counter. And so the execution unit uh, base will then add the hardware required to read those informations if it was not already made uh, to make them available for the branch plugin. So a, a, a few other side effects is like the executing unit base will then notify the ECQ and the dispatcher that uh, it can execute a branch if equals. So yeah, the branch if equals instruction need to find its way through the pipeline, through the multiple executing unit. That's how it is sorted out. As well as the decoder uh, will be notified that when it sees that bit pattern, um, it needs to read those two registers. So the dependency tracker um, will know about it and eventually the register renaming system too. So there was also the concept of having composable pipeline. Mm. And here is an instance. For instance, the branch plugin uh, will need to calculate where the branch uh, has to go. And so, OK, to do that, he will retrieve the execution unit, uh, unit base with the same ID as us, like in the slide. And then, if you ask to the clean unit to provide the stage from the pipeline API, uh, which represents the execute stage zero. Like you could, you could implement your branch plugin over multiple stages, and here you, you, you ask the pipeline API representation of a, the, a given stage. And then you can use, for instance, the program counter key to access the value of the program counter key, which was inserted by the existing unit base uh, above in the pipeline and drive the schedule interface. And so, um, yeah, another thing is there, there was a few, a few issues with memory inferring is that in and out of the core and superscalar core, you kind of often need uh, memories with multiple read and write ports. So uh, one way to, 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 to define the memory in Spanish there is that you can okay, define a uh, RAM as being a memory filled with 256 words of a 16-bit event. Then you can create a few uh, write ports and a few read ports. But then, um, the, the, yeah, the issue is that, I mean, it will work in simulation. It will work well in simulation, it will generate uh, proper very log. But the issue with that is that many synthesis tools to put the design on real hardware will not be capable to handle it. They may be capable to handle when you have multiple read ports, but multiple write ports, uh, it is tricky. So the way how things are handled in Axis 5 is the user can still implement memories like this in their pure way. And then um, there is some phase which will uh, walk all the statements defined so far, and it will retrieve. Because basically, yeah, in Spanish, there, when you define things like this, you will feed a netlist representation, an internal representation of the netlist that you can still uh, visit. Like when you do some compiler techniques, things you have the concept of a visitor. Uh, the concept of abstract syntax tree, AST. And here we are iterating over this tree. Like saying, okay, in the current module, uh, work all the declarations done. Uh, if, if you find one, uh, for, for each one of the memory type, then execute this block of code. So here we have pattern matching. 
yeah, you will get this in the terminal because it will, it will find this memory. And then what you can do is you can iterate over all the memory ports of given memory, like uh, to count how many write ports there is, how many read ports there is, and if you know that it will make issues, then you can modify the netlist. Like, okay, say memory dot remove statement. That will remove the memory from the netlist and you can replace it with something else. Like you with maybe a black box or maybe you will want to emulate a memory of this with this layout using uh, multiple simple dual ported memories with some live value table or maybe using some XOR uh, technique on the data to generate multiple write bots. I mean there is there is many solutions. And so for si about simulations, um, in general when we have to simulate things we have to go uh, to one of the big three uh, simulators. But in an open source uh, ecosystem, it's, it's not possible for many reasons. Uh, licenses are really expensive. Uh, there may be a few ways you can get something uh, working without a paid license, but it's really, really slow and limited. So instead, um, Nexus 5 uses Venilator. So here is the full flow. Uh, okay, where you can generate the uh, hardware as we've seen before. Nexus 5, generated from Spanish HDL, we get some Verilog. And the concept of Verilator is it is a tool. You give Verilator your synthetizable uh, Verilog, and it will generate a C model, which is cycle accurate. It will only be able to translate synthetizable code, so it's, it, it works well in our use case. So. From that C++ model, uh, C++ test bench that we have to implement, and Spike, I will come uh, back on Spike in the next slide, we will compile all those guys together uh, with GCC, and we will get an executable which will be our simulator. And uh, for instance, here, uh, our simulator, we can execute it with a few arguments, like to load a given benchmark, like the right stone benchmark and given memory and it will execute in terminal. At a decent speed, uh, it depends on the configuration of the CPU, but you will get between 100,000 uh, 100, hertz, yeah, 100 kilohertz and 200 kilohertz of uh, cycles per real time second. And so, to, to speak a bit about Spike, so Spike, it is, I would say, the official risk 5 simulation tool. So you can provide Spike uh, a given binary and ask it to execute uh, one instruction after each other. And basically, it will be used in our test bench as a golden model of what the next risk 5 should do. So, and basically, it is. Yeah, it is used in a way to check that our CPU is is staying in check with the uh, RISC-V specification. So in our benchmark, when our CPU Nexus 5 commits something, uh, we will make Spike commit something and compare the result. Uh, so it's just a few, but it's still, it's not like letting Nex uh, run and logging something letting Spike run and logging something and comparing the two full execution log. It's, it's really a lockstep way because, for instance, when you have an interrupt uh, proposed to NAX coming from outside, you have an interrupt coming from the outside, NAX will not necessarily take that interrupt <coughs> uh, in a deterministic, deterministic manner. It really depends what it has to do it may continue a little bit and then take the interrupt. And so for that reason, for instance, when Nexus 5 take an interrupt, that interrupt is then proposed to spike. So there is a few um, synchronization between the two models which are done like this to keep them uh, at the same execution, in the same execution flow. So 
and then you can um, generate some traces. Like um, in general, uh, people are using VCD trace in the open source world. But with Verilator, more and more we can use FST trace, which are really compressed. And we'll keep track of all the signals of uh, the CPU. So you really have the full view of the design with it. And you can also extract some interesting metrics, like, for instance, how much, uh, how much ECQ is full, how much IQ is full, stock Q is full, uh, to see when there is some uh, misprediction, when the CPU is rescheduling to a new to a new place. And you can also generate some GAM5 traces that you can visualize with Konata in a quite different manner. So this trace here is showing uh, the execution flow, which is going to execute at when when they are fetched in blue, uh, when they are decoded and renamed, when they are waiting in the issue queue uh, for dependencies. Um, and in Lime, it is when they are being executed. And here you can see the out of order uh, execution in the core. Like for instance, <coughs> this instruction, even if it's uh, defined after this one is executed before because dependencies were really already available. So it's quite interesting to look in that uh, kind of graph to debug performances, to understand how the, the core work. And yeah, that's it. So um, here is a few links to the, with the doc, the GitHub repository. And the roadmap is yeah, getting Debian tested, um, memory currency and multicore support, and eventually why not trying to target ASIC? Because currently it's uh, mostly for soft core, but yeah, it could be interesting too. Also, yeah, thanks for Net for the funding, and now I should be here for the question. Hi. Charles, can you hear me? Charles, hello. Okay, we're having some issue here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I was unexpecting that, that I need to initiate a call. Anyways, so uh, for the audience, uh, this is Charles, who is the creator of the Next Resfi and the Vest Resfi, which is which is the very widely adopted software and win the actual RISC-V software champion back in 2018. So we're here open for questions that anyone would like to know about his newly created uh, out of order risc -V core. Yeah, we have a live one here. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, but it's interesting uh, because from, uh, I, I know another uh, language like uh, Chiso and it's familiar uh, to your uh, uh, language Spanish or HDL. And uh, uh, could you please uh, uh, have a comparison uh, from your perspective uh, uh, for those two tools? Uh, having, um, having a comparison with what? Sorry? Uh, with uh, Chiso. Ah, with Chiso? Yeah, yeah. Um, mostly I would say. As a, there is a lot of history behind it, uh, especially when Chisel was in the version two, two in the second version of Chisel. Now it, it's Chisel three, so things change a bit. But I would say that now mostly it is about strictness and link, linting. Um, Spinal XDL is a bit more like VXDL, uh, not letting you assign um, signal of different trees together. Um, there, there is this kind of things, I would say. As well, the, the rule where the names are handled is um, 
quite different. So overall, I would say a lot of little details. And one big detail is that Spinal Ideal integrate a library with all the, um, a, a large library, a much larger library than uh, Chival uh, in the base language, like um, UART, um, SPY, a lot of peripherals uh, and buses are implemented in the core. That way, different people um, working with Spinal Ideal will, will, can, can use the same uh, base Thanks a lot. So basically, uh, Chiso is more like uh, just a Howard Sue language, and, and, and on, the, on the other hand, uh, the Spino HDL is equipped with many toolboxes and uh, a lot of simulation from what we get there. So this is kind of a system very log uh, to the very log comparison. Do I, uh, do I say it correctly, or, <laughs> or do I misunderstand something? <laughs> I will not. I will not go to that extent because basically, Chisel um, and Spinal uh, share the same paradigm. Uh, this to be really clear. Just really, the, the interpretation and the data are really different. That that provide a really different experience. Uh, for instance, Spinal HDL keep the whole um, abstract syntax tree of the netlist. He keep the whole netlist in memory, while Chisel uh, flush it really fast into the FER. RTL format to go further with the flow, and it has for instance, quite a few side effect, effects. Like um, <coughs> Spinal Ideal can track much more precisely issues because um, he, he keep for for each potential signal he, he can keep the whole stack trace of the context in which the given signal was created. So it, it's really a collection of implementation details which can make quite a big difference at the end. Thanks a lot for your, your explanation. Uh, Thank you also would like you to send a follow-up questions or? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm also very interested about your spinal HDL and uh, the, do you have, could you explain uh, how to you do the uh, body log uh, elaboration? Uh, the question about the log, wh what is it? Uh, Okay, uh, in Chiso, uh, we use the FIRTL uh, to elaborate the VLOG. Uh, in other words, uh, to generate the VLOG call. Uh, could you exp uh, is, uh, explain uh, how, how did you uh, do it? Uh, so, basically, Nicholas has... Ah, it goes... Yeah, 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 yeah you go ahead, please. Yeah. Oh, um, so, yeah, the question is how it goes to VLOG, right? Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> so, <coughs> uh, it goes... Okay, when you, okay, just to go the full path. So when you use the Spinal API, it will fill an at least in memories. There will be a few transformation phase, a few check phase, and then it will go directly to Verilog or to the HDL. It goes directly to it. There is no intermediate file format. It, it, it will, uh, so basically the Spinal HDL is directly being translated into the synthesizable